I have these little hints to myself, the little yellow star, meaning that I should stop and start again. So now comes something different, preparing for the next part. So here I fill the screen uh, with lots of uh, properties. I'm trying to now explore uh, these different limbs and so on. So first, if we start on the left corner of this slide. So I got a claim here, uh, um, which is actually it's, it's proven if you can prove it's correct. So it says that if we take the limit at a of a function f, and we conclude that it is L1, and we also conclude that it is L2, then these two numbers have to correspond. They have to be equal. So from the logical definition on the previous slide, I mean, from this, it's not obvious at all. I mean, there's lots of squiggly symbols and for alls and epsilons and deltas and so on. And then that this should have any kind of property like that is not at all obvious. So it needs to be proven separately. So that it's a good exercise to prove this. So that if you, and there is, there is a two variants of that exercise in the book. So if you really have two different, potentially different limits, they are actually not different. But anyway, when you have proven that, or if you just trust the book, then we go down one level and say, okay, lim can be used as a partial function from a and f. So what do I mean with that? So I mean that if you give it an a and an f, it may not have a limit, but if there is a limit, the limit is unique. So a partial function is something which behaves like a function with the only problem that it might not always be defined. And behaving like a function compared to just being a relation is that the value coming out is unique. The L1 and the equals to L2. I mean, in general, a relation could just relate uh, these three things in all kinds of different ways. But that's the fact. We, we can prove it that lim, if you fix A and F, then L either won't exist or will be uniquely defined. Okay, so that was the first part of this slide. And then we have the typing part here up on the right. So I've written lim three times with different types. And to separate them, I've underlined two of them with a color. So the first lim underscore red, <laughs> lim red, uh, that's the one we've been uh, looking at on the previous slide. So it takes an x, a function x to y, a y, and becomes a proposition, something which can be true or false. And that's also the way I've used it here. But I now want to move towards using it as a partial function. And that's the limb in the middle here. So one way of coding up something as a partial function is to say, okay, it's a total function returning maybe. So this could, uh, at least in theory, you could implement, but it's, it won't be able to do it always. But you can always say nothing if you don't succeed to find the limit. So it should take a point and a function and maybe find out where the function tends to when x gets closer to that point, a. Then very often, uh, as was shown by the first notation, one assumes that actually in a certain paragraph or in a certain page of the book or in a certain exercise, we know that the limits exist. So we ignore the maybe part. We pick a certain combinations of A's and functions F's so that we can always get out a Y. It's not partial anymore, it's total. So that's the limb with an underscore blue here. And uh, it's just more convenient to work with, but you should be, always be aware that it's not obvious that the limit exists. So sometimes one has to really work on, on one of the top levels. Okay, but the blue limb, uh, I want to show here or explain that it's, it's some, this is actually linear or not limb in itself, but limb of A. So notice the, the um, maybe I should have a, well, I can make it black. So the box here around lim A. So lim partially applied to an argument, I claim is linear. So then you might ask, okay, what does linear mean? Well, linear means that if I 
give it a sum, it should also produce a sum. So then you might wonder, or, and, and also scaling, but let's take the sum part first. So this is the first line here. This is a claim which we can prove is, is true. And I won't prove it here, but let's say what this is. I said, it, if it gets a sum, so f plus g, whatever that means, it should return a sum. We will work much more with this kind of structure in the, the next weeks, but let's first look. So lim a, it's applied to the same a here and here, but it's applied to different functions, f and g. So then it's the only question left is, what on earth is this plusle, this plus with a ring? Um, so I thought, okay, let's first try to type check it. So we know that this is the type of the second argument to the blue limb, well, all the limbs actually. So that means that the sum f plus g must have that type. So I given the type here of what I called plus l. And then we also can see that limb on the right hand side is applied to f separately and g separately, meaning that they also have to have type x to y. Okay, so let's see if we can define a functional little expression with what this, this plus with a ring is supposed to be doing. Any suggestions for the right hand side? Well, at least we can know that it has to be a function from x to y. So let's use a lambda expression and write lambda x arrow. Ah, look, somebody spliced something in the chat. So the suggestion there is let's apply f to x and g to the same x and that add up the results. And yes, that is the definition of plus. Law. So it's usually called lifted sum. So lifted, well, in this case, addition. So lifting here means going from an operation which works on y to an operation which works on functions to y. So suddenly it works on more complicated things, but it doesn't do anything very complicated. I guess it would have to deal with the maybe. Yes, if I used instead of the uh, of the blue limb here, used the black limb, <laughs> then it would have to deal with the maybe. But here I've actually, uh, yeah, I, I forgot one blue underline. This is also the blue limb. Um, I've chosen to simplify the matters, but yes, if I would like to use it for the black limb, the limb with a, with a maybe and the result type, I'd also have to take care of the nothing case. Um, and that's also a good exercise. It's also a, a normal functional programming exercise to take addition on the type y to addition on maybe y, and then to addition some functions. But anyway, here it, it doesn't have to, to take care of, uh, of maybe types. But yes, it's a higher order function. It combines two functions to a new function. And we're going to see lots of uses of it later. Um, I will not dig into the definition here, but it's a good exercise for yourselves as well to compute the same kind of operation for scaling. So this, um, this triangle here is, is called scaling. So you want to scale a function by a factor C. Okay, if plus and g are the arguments, why don't we write plus fg? Um, well, so I, I've used this as an infix operator because I'm used to using addition infix. So we could also use a prefix uh, notation, but usually for operators, I write them between the arguments. But yes, uh, the plus all here takes f as first argument, g as its second argument, just like addition takes uh, its first argument on the left and the second argument on the right. Anyway, I just wanted to say that uh, the scaling here, so c times a function just means multiply the result of the function by c. And if we take the limit at a point, 
of a scaled function, it's the same as taking the limit of the function and then scaling with normal multiplication the result. So I should say that the relationship between multiplication and the scaling is roughly the same as between addition and lifted addition. Okay, these things we'll uh, get back to in other cases as well. Let's um, now, actually we can, yeah, let, let's continue because we have a little more time. Let's move on using these properties towards computing derivatives. Okay, so now we're back to quoting a math book. Uh, I did it in the, in the lecture on complex numbers as well. It was the same math book. Uh, the calculus book by uh, that's used for several courses at Chalmers. So this defines the derivative of a function f as another function f prime. So it says up there the, fu the function f prime, and that function is defined by using notice here the limit in the mathematical standard notation. Um, so f prime at a certain point x is the limit as h goes to zero of this quotient. And I mean, this is nothing new for you. You've all seen this before, um, but let's, let's try to look a little bit on the typing here and, and then analyze also the scoping and so on. But I, I wrote on the right-hand side here, what is the type of capital D? So first the question then, what is capital D? Well, the thing is that the derivative here is denoted f prime. So the only sign that something is a derivative is the little, little dash up here, which is a little bit too um, difficult to see for me. So I given it another name. So I call it capital D. So the definition of capital D is that capital D of f is defined to be f prime. You, sometimes you, you say, uh, defined in this way. So, okay, it means that, that D as a function, notice D as a higher order function is the same as priming. So putting a prime afterwards. So I'm using it prefix instead. So if this is the definition of D, what is the type of D? Well, it's, its first argument is a function. So if we have the same typing of functions as before, it's x to y. And then it should return the derivative, which is also a function. And here I will actually write x prime to y. Note, this is not the same prime. This is just another name, x prime. And the reason I write first x prime here is that strictly speaking, the function may very well be defined at more points than its derivative. So if the function has a sharp shift somewhere, the derivative will not be uh, defined at that point. But what we usually do then is to also restrict the function itself. So I will, I will to see the pattern better here, I would just opt for removing that prime to say, just to see that a function, the derivative higher order function is actually something which takes and returns functions of the same shape. So a one argument function comes as an input and a one argument function comes as an output. It takes f to f prime. It's very rarely written like that in math books. You would rule, usually uh, write it in, in this kinds of shape when you always apply the function to an argument x. But I think it's useful to try to also uh, be aware of this notation. Why does D take an extra X and never use it? Well, yeah, okay. So now let's, let's this, this was just for typing D. So let's sort of have that in a box here and start looking at, at the definition. So here I said the derivative of F at X. So what is this extra argument X? Well, the extra argument X, let's use a blue here is here. So X of type X is the second argument to capital D. And then the question in the chat was, why does it take an extra X and never use it? Well, actually it does use it, and but it uses it in a bit of a roundabout way. So notice here, it says that the derivative of F at X 
is the limit at zero of G. And here I'm trying to be a little more clear on what we're doing, what this limit is about. So remember, the limit is really taking a point, well, the zero and a function, but the function is not F. The function is G. So I'm trying to make that clear here by saying, okay, G as a function of age is this expression. And now the question was about X, was it doesn't ever use this? Well, it uses in the where clause, it uses X twice actually. So the definition of G uses X, but I, I agree, it's a bit silly to, to sort of uh, not make that visible in the definition. So let, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide here. Um, G is actually not uh, sort of, uh, it's not a whole story. Um, it really has more arguments. So let's keep the name G and first let's type it. Um, so G here is a function which takes one age which should be the limit when it goes to zero. So we can say it's, uh, make a black pen here. It takes say an R plus two. Well, it should return something which is possible as an input. I mean, it should, should be possible to add to X. So let's say it's, uh, it returns, um, no, sorry. Uh, H is of R plus, but uh, the return type of G should be the same as the return type of F. So let's erase that part. It's actually a Y that comes out here. So G is a helper function, which uh, as somebody mentioned then in the chat, it seems to use an X. So I've now instead said that, okay, let's, let's define another helper function. Um, and the other helper function I call phi. So then I'm saying, okay, G is actually phi of X. So the invisible argument G, I've here from G, I've said instead phi of X when I moved on one step. Okay, then phi of X instead of G, phi of X and H is still this expression. So then of course we can ask ourselves, what is the type of phi? So phi first takes an X of type capital X, and then it has the same type for the rest as G. So it takes an R plus for the age and returns the Y. I mean, both X and Y are probably real numbers here, so we shouldn't uh, be too cryptic about it, but just to keep them apart a little bit. Okay, so now uh, we, we, we could have the same kind of question why does D take F as an argument and never use it? There is no F there, there's no F here, there's no F here. Well, the same kind of situation is the case here. The expression locally uses F twice. So we can take this one more step. So we take this one more step and define another function, psi. So now it becomes, I, I can add, add one intermediate step here. So this is equal, oops, sorry, equal to limit at zero of psi of f and x. So the same case as I did before, I said that g is actually a special case of a function or it, it's a partially applied function phi to x. And phi in turn is a partial application of psi to f. So now finally we have a definition here, uh, no, sorry, here of psi, which now is almost as long as its uh, body, but it really is self-contained. I mean, psi takes f, x and h, and it uses all of them in the expression on the right-hand side. So I've now, the only thing I've done here is given name psi to the function which computes the sort of main quotient that all the derivatives are at the bottom level defined as. And then I've done one more step. So notice I said here that uh, D of F and X 
is lim zero after psi fx. And then I've here removed the x. So I want to define what the derivative of f is. And I can see that this is actually a composition of the function lim at zero and psi f. So this is equal to lim zero function composition psi f applied to x. So now is the question in the chat, is age given as argument to phi in the correct order? Well, let's see. So remember we said that we have the limit of the function g. Whoops, sorry, I shouldn't draw. We have the limit of the function g here when g when age approaches zero. So age needs to be the last argument. And then phi of x, I've just defined that to be g. So g is phi of x. So, I mean, we could put the arguments in any order we wanted, but the nice thing of having a just the last argument is that we don't have to write it here, neither there nor here. So remember limit takes a function to find the limit of, and phi of x is also a function. It's a function of age, and that age is not written out. And then when we get to psi, psi is actually a function of three arguments. And here in the definition, we left out two of them. So what happens when you apply d of f to an x is that x comes as the second argument to psi. And then that becomes a function hungry for an age, which hasn't been supplied yet. But the limit at zero will take that function and try to search for its limit. And here is a, is a concise way on the right hand side here to summarize the typing information here. So here, I, I instead of using x and y, I've just said that everything is r. So x equals r and y equals r and so on. So this diagram is trying to illustrate that d of f is a function from r to r. That was this, this left part of the diagram is saying. So this d of f is, is an, uh, a label on this uh, typing. So r to r is the function, has the, is a type of d of f. And actually, as it's written, it's a function composition of two things. I can say that actually I take an r. Let's, let's write this out. So we have an x, which is now I write lm of in the opposite direction. So x is an element of r. And then we map that to psi f of x, which is an element of r to r of this type. And what function? Well, it's g. So the, the function g here of an age, that's this first thing maybe should be an r plus to, to keep in, in what I said with the previous one, that age is actually not allowed to be zero because we're dividing by age over here. So um, anyway, psi of f takes a real number to a function, limit at zero takes a function to a real number again. And that's the definition of the derivative. So we've tried here to step-by-step -step code up the properties uh, of, or, or sort of the, the definition of the derivative in such a way that we can use limits. So if we can prove properties like that limit is a partial function, limit is linear and different aspects of it, and a function which we haven't really talked much about, we only defined here, the psi function, it turns out that that function is also linear and it has a number of, of nice properties, which allows us to compute derivatives for certain functions. So given the definition, if we know properties about lim and properties about psi, which is a simple expression here, it's just, it's just this, then we can, in, we can prove properties about derivatives. So it's maybe not the, the way it's defined in the math books usually, but um, yeah. But by the way, I should check, uh, 
is H given as argument to phi in the correct order? It, have, have you been convinced now that it is? Yes, okay. Yeah, it's a bit tricky. And, and I mean, even though the definition of psi here is so short, it still takes a while getting used to. And I will give a few examples of computing with psi uh, just after the break for computing the derivative of squaring and addition and so on. So, um, but I think now is the good time to, to break and then we'll be back at um, quarter past. And as usual, you can ask questions during the break in the chat. <laughs> 